This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream. Sign up today and you'll also get access to Nebula, a video platform that is owned and operated by your favorite content creators. Hi, I'm T1J. Follow me. This video, much like every other video, would not be possible without my patrons and now also members, including people like my first member ever, William Dalporto, and also supporters like Joy F. Sable, Keegan Anderson, and Justin Bailey 77. Thanks to all of the homies who support me, and if you'd like to help out the channel, you can become a homie yourself by clicking the join button below the video or by checking out my page on Patreon. Hey, let's check out the voicemail. T1J, my name is James. Um, I'm a white male, and I was recently having a discussion with a, with a friend, and I said I was trying to read more diverse voices, because I read a lot of books. Uh, so I've been trying to read more books by authors who are women, immigrants, Muslim, African American, trans, etc. My friend said that if I'm reading an author because they are a minority, then that's tokenization. But I was thinking that I was just trying to make sure at least like half the books I read are by women and minorities, so I'm trying to make sure that I hear more diverse voices. So I just wanted your opinion on um, if trying to read more minority authors is a form of tokenization or if it's a good thing to be trying to uh, read more diverse voices. Thank you. So, I'm 34 years old, which seems to be a lot higher than the average age of people who watch YouTube and people who specifically watch videos like the ones that I make. So I'm always kind of worried that my takes and worldview might be unrelatable or out of touch in the eyes of certain segments of my intended audience. Now, according to Google, I'm a millennial and so are people who are 10 years younger than me, which seems to imply that we share certain sensibilities and outlooks because of the generation in which we were born, which may be true to some extent, but I routinely look at people who are in their early 20s with utter bewilderment, much less people younger than that. This is also true when comparing myself to black people of a younger age, especially those who are socially and politically active. So although I've devoted a lot of time on my channel to discussing race issues, I sometimes wonder if the younger generation of online minority activists are on a whole nother level that I am too far gone to really be involved with. My thesis is, and pretty much always has been, that it's important to find ways to discuss and evaluate solutions to serious issues in a productive way. And my assertion is that the most productive way to do so is using civility and compassion. You know, that whole Heiko thing. The problem is that most political discussions these days are had on social media, which is notable for its distinct shortage of those two things, which I think has changed the landscape of how people think about politics. Now this sounds like a huge digression from the topic of the voicemail, but I just want to say I still feel confident in my thought process, and if I make a convincing argument for you, that's great. But I also don't want anyone to get into a mindset where they think something is okay or correct just because T1J said it. I'm just one guy on the internet. And maybe there are takes out there that are worth considering even if my joint pain have an ass thinks they're weird. It's something that I want to emphasize for this topic, but also something I've been meaning to emphasize in general. So might as well go ahead and do it now. So I think that people in marginalized groups have always had a healthy skepticism of people from privileged groups, but these days that skepticism seems to be evolving into widespread mistrust, if not outright antagonism. Some of this may be justified, as we've seen over the past decade what seems to be an increase in bigoted political propaganda coming from the right, and even violence towards groups like black people and LGBTQ people. But this mistrust has evolved and even spread towards progressives and people on the left. Some of it is the unrealistic expectation for privileged people to automatically understand the plight of those who are marginalized, the you should know better mentality. It's an idea that a person isn't allowed to call themselves an ally unless they have total understanding of all the relevant social justice issues. And if they make wrong assumptions or use the wrong terminology or work with the wrong people, tweet the wrong thing 10 years ago, they are susceptible to being 
hashtag canceled. This has grown to the extent that even people who are actively trying to inform themselves are met with suspicion and criticism. So what is tokenization or tokenism, which is the word I will use because it's easier to say. My first experience of this idea is I think from movies and TV shows that had a supposedly token minority person on it. The argument is that only a superficial or minimal effort is made to be inclusive to minorities in order to give the appearance of diversity. And so a character from one of these minority groups is shoehorned into the story without any believable reason for them being there. And yes, I'm gonna use this opportunity to talk about sitcoms again. Maybe I should just make some videos about sitcoms outside of the politics involved because I kind of just always want to talk about sitcoms. Would you guys watch that? Often these characters are brought on the show specifically to engage the main characters about topics like race and sexuality. And beyond that, they really serve no purpose. But other times they're brought on very clearly to address a lack of diversity and often as a response to public criticism. So there are two issues I see with this idea of the token minority character. Firstly, it's difficult to determine when a character is in fact a token. I would never suggest that we be so cynical that any time a minority character is added to a show or a movie, we then accuse the creators of tokenism. Sometimes characters who represent typically marginalized people add value to media that would clearly be lost without them, even if their characters aren't designed to start a conversation about social issues. But sometimes, of course, the token is kind of a shitty stereotype that reinforces negative sentiments towards already marginalized groups. But sometimes it's hard to say. Maybe, like most things, it's fucking complicated. In that rights are applesauce. The second problem with this idea is that it is remarkably similar to complaints of forced diversity from the reactionary right. I don't want to spend too much time on this idea because I don't think it's a very well thought out argument, but it's essentially the same concept on the surface. It's the notion that media creators force women and minorities into their stories simply to create a superficial image of diversity. The difference is in why they think it's bad to do that. While tokenism causes concern because of how it might caricature and dehumanize minorities and often reinforces negative stereotypes, Forced diversity is usually cited as a pandering cash grab implemented at the expense of the quality of the story being told. Never mind that some of the most critically acclaimed and widely appreciated media gets accused of forced diversity, Steven Universe and Star Wars. This is dumb, of course, because it implies that it's okay for able-bodied cis hetero white men to appear in media by default, but if a woman or a minority is added, there needs to be some explanation for them to be there. And it has to be a good, well-written character. Otherwise, that's evidence that it was forced. And never mind all of the terribly written white male characters, it's okay for those to exist. It's dumb, like I said. The problem is that sometimes these poor arguments slip into the tokenism conversation as well. The token person of color, for example, may seem to not have a purpose within the story, but who says they need to have a purpose, or at least any more purpose than any other character would need in that role? Why can't they just be another person in this fictional world? I feel like we don't demand this level of complexity and backstory from white male characters. What I look for is whether or not the characters are objectified, otherized, or treated differently than the others. An important thing to note is that otherizing can be negative or positive. Sometimes characters in media are negative stereotypes, but also sometimes creators overcompensate by making minorities unrealistically virtuous, sometimes literally magical. This can still have the result of tokenizing characters by illuminating the fact that they're really kind of out of place in the world. I think when people who create media really care about their minority characters, they usually don't tokenize them. They treat them like humans, or at the very least with as much depth and care as they would any other character in that position. So I'm fortunate enough to have a lot of friends, and a lot of those friends are white. So depending on the social situation I'm in, I sometimes find myself the only black person and sometimes the only non-white person in the room. 
And sometimes people will joke that I'm the token black guy in the group. Now it's a joke, but you can understand that joke in multiple ways. Maybe it implies that white social groups might befriend a black guy just to demonstrate to the world that they're not racist. You know, the I'm not racist, I have a black friend thing. It's a meme that's been around for ages and it's a perfect example of tokenism. Or it could satirize the fact that white friend groups often don't include people of color at all. So the fact that I'm there is fairly conspicuous. But again, are we going to argue that if a group of white people hangs out with a black person, that means they're tokenizing them? Tokenism is also an area of concern in the workplace. Much like what I've discussed before, sometimes companies hire minorities with the primary goal of avoiding criticism and creating a shallow appearance of diversity. But like with media and the friend groups, just because a minority is added doesn't necessarily mean that the person isn't actually valued. As a black person, I have been in situations where I have felt like people are treating me differently, both in negative and positive ways. I've been in situations where a person has told me straight up, I'm giving you an opportunity, yes, because I value you, but also in large part because you are a minority, and I understand that diversity is important and minority voices are often silenced. Now all you young folks out there correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like some of you might feel tokenized by a situation like that because you are being treated differently than other people. But personally, I usually appreciate things like that. I think that one of the ways that allies help marginalized people is by using their influence to provide opportunities to them that wouldn't otherwise exist. And sometimes, as a black person or LGBTQ person or woman or disabled or neurodivergent person, it's efficient to take advantage of opportunities to increase your standing in the world, even if the intent of the person who gave you that opportunity is superficial. So you can then use your experience expanded resources to achieve your goals and help others achieve theirs. But as far as tokenism goes, I do think intent matters. If you get hired somewhere, or get promoted, or signal boosted, or you get invited into a friend group and you want to know if you've been tokenized or if you're the tokenizer, there are a couple things you can look for according to a great blog I read which I'll link in the description. Those things are diversity, equity, and inclusion. Firstly, if the claim is that diversity is the goal, you should see an ongoing and earnest pursuit of it. If a company hires one gay person and never hires another one until that person leaves, that's a good sign of tokenism. If a showrunner creates a show with only a couple of black people, maybe check how many black people are on their next show. If it's still few and far in between, could be tokenism. If you're recommending YouTubers of color and you've been shouting out T1J and Cat Black for the past four years because you've never bothered to find any others, maybe it's tokenism. The second thing you need to look for is equity. Equity means equal access to resources and other things available to everyone involved. So if a company hires a disabled person but makes their salary lower than everyone else's, that's evidence of tokenism. If a minority is one of the main characters of a movie but barely gets any lines and dies in the first 20 minutes, probably a token. And finally, inclusion, which kind of encompasses the other two. Tokenism as a whole could arguably be succinctly described as diversity without inclusion. People from marginalized groups should feel just as important and just as valued as anyone else involved and should be treated as individual human beings and not representatives of whatever group they happen to be in. If you tell everyone about your awesome good friend who's transgender but never actually invite them to hang out like you would your other friends, that's probably tokenism. This is why minorities can often feel tokenized even when they're being promoted and given opportunities. So if you want to signal boost or endorse people from these groups, find a way to do so that's inclusive and not otherizing. Feel free to give special attention to people if you think they deserve it, but don't do it just because they happen to be a minority. It's like, are you helping me because you like me or just because I'm black? And don't just stop there, remember the diversity and equity parts as well. At the end of the day, if you're not actively doing something just to avoid criticism and just to give the appearance of diversity, you're probably not guilty of tokenism. 
I think a lot of people just simply don't know how to navigate conversations about race and gender and sexuality, which is fair because it's complicated. Hyper awareness of these things leads to stereotyping and generalizing, while attempts to erase these concepts ignores the fact that they play a big role in the everyday lives of millions of people. So I think we also have to analyze people's intent and meet people where they are. So how can we translate this strategy to political discussions and informing ourselves with diverse viewpoints? Finally, we address the actual question that was asked in the voicemail. But by now, hopefully you have some idea of what my answer is. The mere act of including, endorsing, or learning about marginalized people is not tokenism. In fact, James, what you're doing sounds like the opposite of tokenism. The problem with tokenism is that it ignores the whole purpose of diversity. Diversity is meant to bring together ideas, cultures, backgrounds, strengths, and talents from a wide variety of people. Tokenism focuses on quotas and group designation, but by making an effort to stay informed and expose yourself to a variety of viewpoints, you take advantage of the very strength of diversity. The only thing that sounds a little weird to me is that you seem to have a very specific number that you're trying to reach. Like I think you said at least half of the books you read. When we start thinking in terms of quotas, that's when we get into tokenism territory in my opinion. I think you should feel free to make a special effort to seek out books by people from underrepresented groups. But if it gets to a point where you're just doing it out of a sense of obligation rather than a genuine desire to explore diverse ideas, that's when it starts to sound a little iffy. Now, I don't know you, James. Maybe you're reading all this stuff just so you can say you did, and just so you can go on Twitter and brag about how many books by women authors you've read. Maybe you spend money on most of your books, but all these books by minorities and marginalized people, you check out at the library so you don't have to pay for them or support the authors. But I get the impression that you're probably all right and your friend's just being a little overzealous. Maybe tell them to take a break from social media for a while. Shit fucks with your mental. That's just me though. What do you think? Thanks for watching, and thanks to CuriosityStream for sponsoring this video. CuriosityStream is a streaming service with thousands of documentaries and nonfiction titles on pretty much every subject you can imagine. Science, history, nature, technology, they've got all of that, which also includes exclusive originals you can't find anywhere else. In honor of Martin Luther King Day, which was a few days ago, consider checking out King, a filmed record, Montgomery to Memphis, an amazing compilation of videos which document many of the major events from the life and work of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. It's presented largely without commentary. It's just an authentic look at how those events really went down. It's very cool. The best part is that a CuriosityStream subscription is only $2.99 a month. Not bad. But if you'd like to try it out, you can get your first month for free by going to curiositystream.com T1J and using the promo code T1J. An additional perk is that by signing up with CuriosityStream, you'll get access to Nebula, a new streaming service that was built by and for independent creators, many of whom you may have heard of, like CGP Grey, Lindsay Ellis, and H Bomber Guy. Oh, and hey look, it's me. Imagine YouTube, but like, only the good videos. That's kind of what Nebula is. Nebula features all of the educational and video essay content that you know and love from YouTube, with no pre-roll ads by the way, but also includes Nebula Originals, exclusive content that you can only find on Nebula. In fact, that's part of the reason Nebula was established, to give creators a space to experiment with new content without having to worry about whether or not it's gonna get demonetized or noticed by the almighty YouTube algorithm. So click the link in the description below to check out CuriosityStream and Nebula. Now this is when I'd normally say that by subscribing to CuriosityStream, you also support me and help me take my content to the next level. And that's still true. But in this case, you're also supporting an entire community of thoughtful, talented creators. 